All right. So a financial analysis of Asana. Asana is a clothing store. They have several names. Dress Barnes is probably the best known, but they have a few other stores that you probably have seen and heard of. They tend to be in strip malls. Not a large, large company. You can see on this first page, their revenues in 2012 were about $4.7 billion. So not a huge firm. We'll see in the numbers that they have had some struggles. So we'll look at their struggles. We're gonna compare them to, um, to Ross. Ross's numbers will probably look a little bit better and we'll, we'll see. So what we wanna do is looking at these numbers and these are in, in Dropbox. So you can find them under, under quiz review. So I'm gonna write the paper. I'll start off telling what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna say um, in this paper, I will assess the financial um, state of Asana by verse assessing its short-term viability. I'll be looking at liquidity and solvency, and you can do summary on the exam. You can do you know summary things like that in parentheses. I don't need everything in exactly in prose. Bullets are fine. Paragraphs are, I mean, uh, outline form is fine. <coughs> and then assess its long-term prospects for growth. And here I'm going to look over, and you can use all terms here. I'm going to say turnover and margin. You can say top line growth, bottom line growth. So that's what we're going to do. So let's first let's assess its short-term viability looking at liquidity. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and put the outline first, and you can certainly do it in outline form. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at CFO growth. After I assess CFO growth, I'm going to compare CFO to EBIT and see if we have any major issues there. After I do that, I'm going to look at their net working capital requirement. I'm going to ask questions of is it a source, is it a use, what's its trend? Uh, is there anything I need to say under that related back to the CFO versus the EBIT? And the last thing, last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at shareholder cash flows, assessing their confidence. This is a firm that feels very, very confident to send money back to its shoulders or not. So CFO growth is pretty straightforward. We just go to the financials and we find the line on the financials, line 11, that says cash from operations. We can see back in 05, it was 164 million. Today it's $450 million. That's a pretty solid growth, 15.5%. So I'm gonna say has some healthy Healthy growth. Robust. No robust. 15, what? Robust. Ro oh, no, no, no robust. 15.5% since 2004. Um, this is especially healthy given the financial uh, environment. Wouldn't you agree? We've gone through a major, pretty major recession. This is. This is somewhat of a, a consumer discretionary good. People don't have to buy dresses and clothing. This is somewhat of a discount store, so that may give them some advantage during a downing environment, but still 15.5%, definitely much faster than the economy and inflation, so I think that's, that's very healthy growth. So let's look at this versus EBIT. Well, cash from operations grew 15.5%, earnings grew only 9.23%. So, I'm going to say CFO. Notice I'm using abbreviations. Abbreviations are fine if, as long as it's pretty obvious what they are. Right? CFO is, is a pretty common one for cash from operations. Because cash from operation growth is much stronger than EBIT. EBIT, you can definitely use that. That's pretty common. So 15.5% CAGR versus and what was the other one? Nine point nine point two percent. 
this is comforting from a standpoint of quality of earnings as cash flow is is or as gives evidence earnings are not being propped up by accruals. Does that sentence make some sense? What's the big difference between cash flow and earnings? It's those accruals, accounts receivable, inventories, accounts payable, accounts um, accrued. So if cash flow operations is much stronger than earnings, then you can't say that management is somehow using those accruals to try to make their earnings look stronger than they are because the cash flow is very, very strong. So that's good for quality of earnings. However, the divergence is much more than expected. So more research is needed. And at this point, you could probably just leave it there because you're going to about to talk about networking capital requirement, which is most likely the answer for the divergence. All right. But one thing I do want to do is I want to go look at the charts. I go to page two. I see chart eight. And I notice that this divergence is what? A very recent phenomenon, really just the last two years. Uh, so I'll say I do notice in chart eight that this divergence is very recent. CFO and EBIT moved in lockstep until the past two years. Everybody agree with that? So it's curious to figure out why that happened. Well, most likely it's networking capital. So since the next thing we're looking at is networking capital, let's start with, let's look at that and see what's going on with networking capital requirement. So we look down here, networking capital requirement. We notice that networking capital assets have actually grown faster than networking capital liabilities. We also notice that it went from a source to a use. So I'll put those in. I'm going to say networking capital requirement has shown a major uh, switch the past several years going from a source cash in 2004 to a use of cash in 2012. Working capital assets has grown much faster than working capital liabilities. 21% versus 17%. You could put those numbers in to your answer as well. Or 22%. Well, this creates a dilemma because this somewhat contradicts what we just saw above. So this needs much more research as it contradicts what we found in number two. And I'm going to probably just leave it there. Um, what I'll do on this particular one, I'll find the best student paper for this exam and I'll put it out there as well for you so you can see their answer. But it does create a disconnect. Good question. Can you just explain why contradictory? I guess because if assets grow, the cash should be less. Is that why? Contradictory? Right. When working capital assets grow, that's a drain. That's going to make your cash operations be lower than your earnings. Okay. So there's something bizarre going on in this company. Uh, it's hard to answer. What I'm giving you credit for here is not that you answer that question, but that you acknowledge that yeah, there's something stranger. And that's the hardest thing. Uh, I would keep that formula. I would keep this formula in mind. Net income. Um, plus depreciation minus the change in net working capital requirements equals cash from operations. So if working capital assets are growing, that makes this a bigger negative, which makes CFO smaller. So that's, that's, the, that's the number that we're working with. I'll, I'll leave it in the answer so you can see it.
That means there may be something strange going on with depreciation, which would be really bizarre. There may be, who knows, there's something bizarre going on with this company the last couple of years that's causing it. So we need more research. I don't give you enough information on the exam to answer those questions. So at this point, I'm want, wanting to get it into the template and then acknowledge that there's, there's an issue for more research. You might use that phrase, especially on liquidity, you might use that more research is needed uh, frequently. So, all right, so didn't answer that question, more research is needed, that's fine. Let's look and see how confident management is with their cash flows, given how, many, how much cash flows they're paying to their <coughs> investors. And here what we notice is back in 2005, they only paid out $3 million. In 2012, they paid out $156 million. That's an 80% growth. However, you'll also notice that it's been really, really volatile. It's been all over the place. You don't see any dividends being paid. You're seeing stocks getting, being pay, bought back but even issued. So we're seeing a firm that um, is all over the place. So we're gonna say has grown tremendously <coughs> since 2005, and I think I used 2004 up here. Let me fix that. Since 2005, however, it has been very volatile. The firm pays no dividends and sometimes buys stock back and other times issues stock. Recently they appear to be uh, paying down debt. This outflow in 2012 does reflect management confidence in liquidity, so they did a net inflow in 2011, so very volatile. I don't know if this reflects confidence as much as it reflects a management that's kind of all over the board. So I'm a little more concerned of, you know, what is their plan? So that's not part of what we're discussing in this part of the class and in this exam. But boy, in 2009, in the middle of a recession, in 2009, they sent out the largest amount of money they'd ever have. During the peak of the recovery in 2011, they actually get new cash, and then the next year they're paying out cash. So, so appears liquidity is a serious issue to management given the payout, but I question the strategy given the volatility, something like that, but that's, that's a tough one. I don't know how to spell volatility all of a sudden. I was trying to say that it's not a serious issue. Right. Because it's something they can control. Well, the fact that they paid out a hundred and so the issue here is they paid out one hundred and fifty six million dollars last year. Mm -hmm. um, so this one hundred fifty six My argument is the CFO is not going to send out $156 million if they don't have confidence in liquidity, at least in, as of the end of 2012 or in 2012. <coughs> However, because of this volatility in 2011, they were actually requesting cash. So what's going to happen in 2013? So, um, Go back to the spreadsheet. <coughs> uh, so the positive 156 That's an outflow. So that means they actually purchase debt, they actually reduce their debt by 195,000. That reduction is a positive number, debt increase, if they borrow money, that's a negative. So they actually paid down debt 195 million. The strange thing is, and this is why I say it's so volatile, in 2011, they actually bought $16 million of stock back and borrowed 178 million. One year later, they went out and issued $39 million in stock and they paid off $195 million in debt. That is very bizarre, that flipping back and forth like that. Their, their main trend has been to buy, buy, buy back stock. Suddenly they issued $39 million in stock and for some reason they paid down deck. It's very, very strange. So I might put something in here. If I were, if I were doing this, I would say... Well, the year before they borrowed a lot. 
I would say hard to comment on trend as they are all over the place. So, you know, strategy is the issue. So my research would be, you know, I need to go, I need to go hear what management says their, their capital strategy is. Are they trying to pay down debt? Or they, do they have a strategy or is it every year they just come up with something new and it looks so. So I'm not really worried by liquidity as much as if they don't have a strategy and they're kind of all over the place, that gives me some concern. So there it is on liquidity. I guess the amount they borrowed in 2011 was unusually large compared to the other borrowings for the year. Right. And then so suddenly, and then suddenly. They borrowed something for a purchase or right. something and then right. take it back. Right. And that's why I say more research. If they're paying dividends, sometimes firms borrow out at the end of the year. Uh, or borrow in order to pay the dividend, and that's why they can pay back. So that's possible. I mean, that's that's a good point. And you could put that. That would be, I would give you points for saying something like that. Um, it is possible something happened right at the end of 2011 that was then repaid 2012. So might not be an issue. But again, just. Just more research is needed. Could you see that some, if they had bought some assets? Could you see that? Assets? And the data I give you, I don't give you much. So in this, because you only have an hour for an exam, you're, you're kind of limited. It's possible, and even in my Bloomberg data pool, I don't have that much detail. And that's what, you know, in finance, it is detective work. So, but what you want to do in finance, you, want to, you don't want to just start going around with the magnifying glass. You want to figure out, you know, if you've got an 18 room house, you're going to do, you want to figure out which room to go to. So we now know we need to probably do more research in that particular area. So, um, but overall, you know, this is a very strong number here. So this gives me some pretty good confidence, this firm, and it looks, looks like a very good trend, especially these last three years. So when I finalize up my liquidity, I'm going to say, man, you know, the one thing I really notice in liquidity is that very, very strong cash flow operations. That gives me great confidence. Um, so, you know, I'm a little bit worried about what's going on. Number two and number three definitely need more research, but at least I see strong cash from operations growth, so that's, that's a good sign. All right, so now I'm going to move on to their solvency. And so let me first put the outline in there. I'm going to start looking at, oops, start looking at times interest earned. Then look at debt to equity. And then I'll look at uh, combined financial leverage. And if I have anything else, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. If I have a credit rating or something like that, I'll, I'll do that. I don't, I don't know if I do or not. <laughs> so let's look at times interest earned. Times interest earned. Well, it's all over the place. 114, 63, 18, 18 is still extremely strong. Um, it, it is, there is some bizarre things going on here because usually when you see this type of volatility in times interest earn, it's because earnings before interest and taxes are very volatile, but their earnings for interest and taxes is very, very stable. So there's something really strange going on here, but I'm not gonna worry about that. That's something else when I get down and look at their debt, I'll look at it. Their times interest earned at 18.3 is, is very solid. It's down significantly, but so strong does not raise concerns. They cannot handle the debt. So, pretty straightforward one there. So let's look. So it'll be interesting to look at debt to equity. This might, might be a, a kind of an unusual analysis here. We look at their debt. Back in 2005, they had $146 million in debt. Now they have 379. That's a growth of 15%. But their assets have grown 19% and their net worth has grown 21%. So while their debt has grown at a fairly good clip, 15%, it's not radically different than cash from operations. And it's in line with, I mean, it's actually. It's actually much slower than growth in uh, assets and, and, and uh, shareholders' equity. So uh, that sounds like a strong growth, 15%, but relative to everything else, it doesn't look so, so strong. So I'm going to say debt growth at 15% of P 
appears high, but is well below the growth in assets and stockholders equity. Thus, does not appear out of line. So let's look at their actual debt to equity. Their debt to equity has gone from 0.36 to 0.24. And so you can see, <coughs> as can be seen in the drop in debt to equity from, and I've already forgot what I said, but whatever those numbers are, um, from 0.36 to 0.24. But again, as discussed above, with much volatility. I mean, look at these numbers. This, this firm is, is all over the place again. Did you notice those debt to equity numbers in 2011 and 2010? We went 3, 15, 42, 24. That's incredibly unusual. This firm is just all over the place. Most firms that, you remember Walgreens, that the equity was, went from 0.16 to 0.19. It was just this real, real stable, stable, stable growth. Most firms do not, very, very few firms have this type of ferment. So maybe back to Brenda's comment that maybe something unusual happened in 2012 right at the end that got resolved early 2000, I mean 2011 and got resolved 2012. Who knows? But it, there is something, something very unusual going on. So their debt to equity shot up. So more research, more research needed. Wherever you get that research, um, go to the annual report, get the footnotes, you know, look at the discussion, management discussion analysis. There's places you can go to find those, but we don't have it for this quiz, so we're, we're stuck with what we have. Let's look at their combined financial leverage, which includes not just debt, but includes all of their, all of their liabilities. Here's the combined financial leverage for Asena versus Ross, and we can see that it's much, much lower than Ross. We do see that unusual activity 2011, 2012, but even with that, it's well below. So, so we'll say it shows the same volatility as um, discussed above, but is trending down and well below its competitor. Ross as seen in graph whatever that was, graph five. Let's see if I gave credit ratings or not. I don't see any credit ratings anywhere in here, so I don't have that to work with, so that's, that's all I've got. So final conclusion on short term. Ability. This appears to be a, a strong, a, a solid company, I won't say strong, solid company with very strong CFO growth and that, that is generally declining. Most serious issue is the volatility and, and debt, especially 2011, <coughs> where more research is needed. Overall, I do not have serious concerns here or something like that. You know, it's, most, most firms, most firms are not going to have serious concerns. <coughs> If I were to give you a J.C. Penney or something like that, where it's obviously been a new, you know, most firms are going to have been in the news somewhat. So as I said, uh, liquidity is one of the more difficult ones to talk about, but we've got we've got some sense of at least we've got some sense of where we could do more research. If you're like I am, I'm almost like, well, let's go do the research because now I'm really curious. But you know, it's like, wow, what's what is going with this firm? How strange. Okay, now we will turn to long-term growth prospects starting with 
and assessment top line growth. Okay, here I'm going to talk about revenue growth. I'm going to talk about capacity versus true ATO, and then I'm going to talk about the ATO itself. So those will be my my three areas. Are you all starting to get this get the outline now? Starting to make some some sense. Sometimes you say, "Well, I forget the outline," but you got the two pieces of paper there. When you look at it, that's going to generate. So, oh, I see a chart on um, on margin. I better talk about margin. You know, so if you got eleven charts, um, you know you don't have to talk much about the tax one, but you're probably going to talk about all the others. If you got a major chart like ATO times margin, you see that in there, and you never talked about it, then you're probably going to lose points because you probably wanted to talk about that. So. So let the exam itself help you remember. So let's look at revenue growth. Let's see how that, that looks. Wow, 20% revenue growth. Kevin, how's that sound? Great. All right. It looks very strong. Yeah, over. <laughs> yeah, at over 20%, especially in this economic environment. So that's, that's good. But let's assess the source of that growth. All right, so let's, let's look at it and see where is that coming from. <clears throat> Revenue per store increased 3.34%, but they've added 16% growth in stores. That 3.34 seems pretty strong, pretty decent to me. I mean, my, my benchmark there on revenue per store or revenue per square foot or revenue per employee is think about a 2% inflation rate. And you would expect, with, without any effort at all, you should be at least keep up with inflation. You just raise your prices with inflation. So it looks like they beat inflation by one or so percent more. And that's actually a pretty decent number. Because you think about it, you got a store that has an average you know, 50,000 people coming to it. How are you going to suddenly get 55,000 people to start coming to the store? It's pretty tough. It's really hard to do. So anything over inflation, I think, is a pretty good number in that, that there. So, uh, we can see that most of the growth has come from added capacity. A what was the growth? 16%. 16% growth in number of stores. But still the growth in revenue per store is not too shabby as you see, you don't. You can use. You can. You can. You can. You don't have to make it fancy language. Yeah, over three percent. So that's that's pretty good. You were saying three percent that they're being just over the inflation. Were you saying that was good for companies in general, or just this particular industry? For companies, you you'll find very few firms anywhere out there that their growth. And whatever your asset turnover number is, that that growth is much higher than three or four percent. Five percent would be not enormous. It's just really, really tough, especially especially retail with stores. It's really tough for the same store to suddenly have a larger number of people come to it. But just, just feel in like a very really expanding market or something that's not happening. Well, even if it's an expanding market, you know, you think you think like a McDonald's, they're just going to put another McDonald's down if it's an expanding market. At some point, that McDonald's gets its capacity, and pretty much all it's going to do is it's going to grow with the with. So it's actually this growth rate, this three percent growth rate, is one of the hardest things. We love it. So with the example of McDonald's with doing breakfast, suddenly they're getting a lot more business in the same store. Those are pretty rare stories. It's really tough to do that. Um, so this three percent, and I'm just saying this. This is my own experience. That three percent is pretty strong from what you'll see from a lot of stores. Most companies you'll see in the one to two percent range. Especially, remember, we just went through a major recession here. Now, again, this store might have actually benefited from the recession, that people were coming to it. My guess is Walmart probably benefited more than Dress Barn did, but they probably still got some people saying, you yeah, know, these are lower. And Ross, Ross probably, you know, Dress for Less, these are discount stores. They may actually benefit from the recession. That may be part of the reflection there. And again, you know, on this exam, I'm looking for consistency, understanding the analysis. I'm not as interested in we fully, fully understanding Asena because we don't have nearly enough data to do that. So it's just really more to get the template. So I'm going to jump out there and say at, at over 3%, that's that's pretty decent. If I might even in the parentheses um, 
more than inflation. And inflation's the minimum, what you expect. They should at least raise their prices with inflation, so if they get the exact same customers, exact same business, you should ex at least see a 2% there. Now, part of the problem with the saying is their stores are all very different. They have some larger, some smaller ones, but I couldn't get square feet for them. And since I have square feet, I just had to do it per store. So it's possible some of this is an interaction of the type of store that they're doing. So since we don't know that, we have to stick with what we, we have there. And then the last one, asset turnover. Well, that one, we can just go to the asset turnover.